I'll begin with some uh, remarks about Alfred Nobel and uh, Helicobacter. And here he is uh, on the, one of his famous portraits on the uh, cover of his biography. But if you look in his biography, uh, you'll see this, that during most of his life, Alfred Nobel suffered from poor health. He always complained of indigestion, headaches, and occasional spells of depression. So here he was, one of the richest men in the world. He was the first global international tycoon. He invented dynamite. So the Industrial Revolution, the second half of the 19th century, was largely responsible to Alfred Nobel. You would not have been able to get that railway track uh, across America through the Rockies unless you had dynamite. And uh, prior to the discovery of dynamite, he was actually selling nitroglycerin, which was a lot more dangerous and the mortality rate for the workers was about 50% per year or something when they were using that stuff. But anyway, he became very rich, but no matter how rich he was, he was always unwell. And he was, no matter where he stayed, he'd always be in the hotel complaining about the food. But he had chronic dyspepsia, chronic indigestion. Now, the other thing is, uh, in his biography here, the real nature of his health problems at a younger age are not clear, but one may well imagine that he was simply overworked or under serious mental stress. And this is uh, something that crept into medical uh, uh, folklore, I guess, uh, in the 20th century, is that whenever your doctor couldn't make an accurate diagnosis, he would look for the psychosomatic, the brain-gut connection, the medical stress. And he would say, uh, well, the reason you've got all the stomach symptoms, you know, I've examined you and I've looked in Harrison's and we've excluded all the, all the diseases on this list, and you don't qualify for any of them, so it must be stress. And of course, everybody's got stress in their life, and you ask a few questions, you can find some of that. So it's not me, the doctor, who's at fault here because I can't make the diagnosis. I, I have made the diagnosis. It's caused by stress, and it's caused by you and your personality and your family and all the things you are doing. So it puts the blame back onto the patient and the onus on the patient to to somehow uh, do some magical modification of their lifestyle so that they could remove that stress and then remove the disease. But of course, as you know, people with peptic ulcer used to do all these things. They'd quit their job. Then they'd stop smoking and they'd be really miserable and they would still have peptic ulcer. And, and so that was the situation with peptic ulcer. So uh, Alfred Nobel, just one of many, many people with the so-called stress-induced peptic ulcer. And it's a beautiful example of this uh, concept uh, that it was the most classic. It was on the high point of all the stress-induced diseases was peptic ulcer. And it ran in families and it started uh, when you did your working life and nothing much made anything different, made any difference to it uh, until you found you could take these medications. So what I say to people is whenever you are dealing with a common disease which has got a cause which may be stress, prick up your ears, there's an opportunity there. There's a Nobel Prize there for the person who discovers the real cause. So I would say to people that stress makes everything worse, but if someone comes in with, a, with an organic uh, problem or abdominal pain or some kind of symptom which really sounds like a, a, a genuine symptom, I will assume that there's an organic cause and uh, I won't necessarily move into a psychiatric or functional diagnosis just because I cannot find the cause. I'll say, I cannot find the cause. I've ruled out everything that's going to kill you. I can't find any cause. And, and I learned this in Virginia. I say this to my interns and fellows. That patient wants to hear you say one thing before he leaves that room. You have not got cancer. And if you don't say that to the patient, he still thinks he might have it. So just remember, that's one of the other things. If you can't make a diagnosis, it's important that you can say that to the patient. 